Hey everybody, welcome to IAEI News Live. In today's session, we're gonna be talking about the IAEI section meetings. I wanna to touch on a little bit on grounding and bonding, and I wanna focus on a very important topic, very appropriate for this time of year, and that is marinas and marina safety, and it starts now. All right. So first thing I want to talk about is the IAEI section meetings. They're coming up. I mean, they're quickly and rapidly approaching us. And if you don't know anything about them, you need to know something about them because uh, it's important that you are aware of the opportunities that the IAEI presents. Now, what I love about the IAEI section meetings, and this year, what you're gonna find is this year that they are going to be in person. And what I love about these meetings is, is a, it's an opportunity to network. You'll see some of them, the leading in the industry individuals who are on code making panels, who are engaged with writing authors uh, of articles in IAEI news magazines and other magazines who share their information and share their knowledge, sharing their expertise is what they love and enjoy to do, especially when it's focused around electrical safety. So if you've never been to an IAEI section meeting, it's, um, it's an experience. Uh, you'll have vendors there, you will have uh, really great technical content. And what's great about the technical content, depending upon the section that you go to, you will see some very dynamic, um, a lot of energy in the room, no pun intended, uh, around trying to get things right. You'll see these, the debates that will occur uh, in, in a lot of these section meetings, they'll have what they call code panels. And, and what a code panel is basically uh, a combination or an assembly of a lot of questions that uh, industry questions that uh, you know, various inspectors or contractors get over the years. And uh, the code panelists typically are those who sit on a code making panel and they field these questions. Now, they do get them in advance and they do their homework to make sure that they bring accurate answers to the table. But I'm telling you, when it comes to the National Electrical Code, there is no, I mean, very, quite often there is a, a, a clear cut answer, but in many cases, you will get uh, various people vocalizing and voicing their opinions at the microphones. And uh, I tell you, it's in those exchanges when we all learn something. So uh, the IAEI section meetings are, are coming together and I, will, uh, I just wanna go over sort of where we're at with, uh, in this regard. You have the Northwest and Southwest section meetings that are doing, the, the Northwest section and the Southwest section are having one combined meeting and it will occur August 29th through September 2nd at the Nugget Casino Resort in Sparks, Nevada. It will be an in-person and it will be, uh, and registration is ready. Now, uh, I'll tell you that down below in the description for this video and for this session, uh, I have the link for to go out to the IEI website where you can get access to all of the registration information for all of the section meetings that are occurring. So please check out down below uh, the information regarding uh, uh, regarding uh, the section meetings and and you'll find that link and from that one URL you'll be able to get to all of the section meetings which I'm about to cover. So uh, the IAEI Northwest and Southwest sections are August 29th through September 2nd. Okay, the Eastern section, um, Sheraton Pittsburgh Hotel right here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Station Square, it's a beautiful area. I mean, who wouldn't love Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? Uh, this is gonna be an in-person meeting as well and registration is ready. I'll tell you how to get there. Let's just, uh, let's just do that real quick. So what I'm doing here is I've gone to IAEI.org. So if you just go to your browser, type in www.IAEI.org, and you will find this web page. If you go to the menu, 
and look at education. IEI is all about education. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an important part of the fabric of those who are in the electrical industry. And if you scroll down, you will see over my shoulder right here where it says section meetings. Click on section meetings. And Laura Hildreth did a great job in updating this recently where we have now a link to all of the section meetings. There's the Northwestern, uh, uh, Southwestern and Northwestern meeting. It's a joint section meeting, August 29th through the September 2nd at Nugget Casino, uh, Monday to Thursday, August 29th to September 2nd. You can register online. You can download the agenda. Let's take a look at the agenda. You will download a Word document, open that up, and we'll take a look at that. So let's take a look at uh, what the agenda is for the Northwestern and Southwestern section meeting. We have Sunday welcome and reception and special drawing in the last half hour. I'll tell you what, the, the welcome and reception meetings, uh, don't underestimate those because that is where you will get to mingle and create relationships. You'll be able to make your contacts. If you've never been to a section meeting, Take advantage of these social times when you can introduce yourself. Uh, believe me, it's don't feel uh, don't feel like you are intruding on anybody. You get there, introduce yourself, explain who you are, where you're from, uh, strike up a conversation. You will be surprised how um, welcoming uh, that uh, everyone is because we love to see new members and uh, new attendees. On Monday. Let's take a look. Uh, you'll see the organizational reports. You'll have some great feedback from the IO, et cetera, the international office. You'll have section business being conducted. And then in the after, introduction and visitation of exhibitors. So exhibitors play an important role. And what I love about the, ex the exhibitors, and I, you know, having been, you know, my first experience from, an, from, a, from a section meeting perspective was standing behind the table answering questions thoroughly enjoyed the questions. Uh, and what you'll find is that the exhibitors, all of the different manufacturers, doesn't have to be a manufacturer. It could be electrical contractors, could be like Electrical Safety Foundation International. Like a lot of different uh, organizations will have a presence at these meetings. You never know who's gonna be there. And uh, the experts are there and they're there to talk about electrical safety. They're there to talk about the latest products in the industry that are hitting the streets, what's coming down the pike, what was just released. This is your opportunity to talk to manufacturers and others about the latest in electrical safety, things that are going to help you meet the National Electrical Code. You're not going to want to miss this. Uh, educational module one is significant changes to codes impacting electrical in installations. So they're going to cover analysis of changes for the 2020 National Electrical Code in parts well, part one, chapters one through four. You're going to have the International Building Code, the International Residential Code, and Fire Code, significant changes impacting electrical installations. That's another critical and important piece to understand that the development, the, the, a structure that goes up is not just about the electrical codes. It's about the system. The structural integrity of that building can impact the electrical installation. I mean, it's not hard, it's not a stretch. HVAC installations can impact the electrical installations. So there is an overlap. And what I love to see, and I, and, and, uh, I, I, I would love to, I'd love to hear this presentation that talks about the changes in the building code, the residential code, the fire codes, uh, around significant change, changes impacting the electrical installations. Module two is on emerging technology and alternate materials and methods. So there's a code form breakfast. Now, multiple, you know, what you'll learn if you get to, if you get the opportunity to actually go to different section meetings, every section meeting has a different perspective. You don't get the same material at every section meeting, which is kind of cool. If you, if you have the ability to travel, if you're going to fly somewhere, you may look at the agenda for the Southwest and Northwestern section and say, you know what, I want to learn more about that. And you may attend that one. You may attend multiple section meetings, which I think is really cool because 
these are in different geographical locations, and there are different geogra there are different um, uh, important aspects of electrical design that vary based upon the geography around the country, right? You, you may be in California talking seismic, but you're probably not going to talk about that, uh, you know, in West Virginia, for example. Uh, it's not as a, a pertinent of a, of a conversation. The code forum breakfasts are typically Q&A. They're typically answering questions. And sometimes I know uh, the, the one I, I, uh, I attended, it was, uh, it was really cool because it was a contest. Every table had a little clicker. They would put a question up. You had to see how fast you could answer it. And if you answered the question correctly, you got into a runoff. And then finally, they gave the a winner. Uh, they gave everybody at the table, like, I don't know, 20, 50 bucks or whatever it was. It was absolutely awesome. So, uh, and I say that because I was at a winning table, just saying. Uh, it's all about working as a team. So 2020 code analysis changes low voltage, Article 725, 760, 770. They're going to be talking digital electricity. Now, there's a topic, digital electricity. Um, if you think about, in, the, in, the, in our uh, talk last week with Keith Laughlin and Jody Wages, we talked about the 2023 code cycle and some of the key topics that are occurring and digital electricity is in there, and we have a new power limited circuit, a class four circuit being introduced in the 2023 code cycle. If you want to get the reasons why the energy around these lower voltage applications, why that exists in our marketplace, this is going to be an interesting discussion to hear from 1045 to 1145. Uh, and then module three is interconnected electric power production sources. You've got the renewable energy uh, changes in the 2020 code. You've got resources and activities. You've got some microgrids. Article 712 is going to be discussed. Energy storage systems. I'm telling you, these section meetings and the, the topics that they talk about, they're, they're, what, they're, they're what the electrical industry is facing right now. And in some cases, technology is going faster than the code. And we have to all together understand how do we address these installations when I have a new product on the market or I have a new application and I can't find the requirements in the National Electrical Code. Or maybe uh, the requirements are there, but they're in the later version and I'm in a state that's in an older version. If you have those types of situations, now is the time to talk about it at these section meetings. When that presentation is going on, this is the time for you to ask those questions because these specialists, the experts are in the room. And collectively as an organization, collectively as, as individuals attending that meeting, we build our knowledge together. Not any one person knows everything. Uh, so these, these meetings are opportunities uh, that I, and I think are unparalleled in the industry. Uh, then you have an education module for electrical fundamentals, what you need to know, but we're afraid to ask and grounding and bonding is going to be covered. And, you know, there's a topic. I don't care who you talk to. You could have what you think is exactly the way things are in grounding and bonding. And there will be four or five different people in the room and they'll have four or five different opinions and maybe even seven different opinions on the topic that you're speaking about. But what's really cool about that is. That's how we learn. Everybody brings something different to the table, and you will see that times 10 at one of these meetings, because not only do you have individuals sitting in the audience that are currently either inspecting, designing, or installing various power systems within the, in and around the country, you also have different code-making panel members. Uh, you got to remember that, that this is the IAEI, and, and the IAEI is is brings together design engineers, union, non-union, electrical inspectors, uh, and others under one, uh, under one umbrella. And many of them will be code-making panel members, but maybe they are not a code-making panel member that represents IEI. For example, I go to IEI meetings. I sit on code-making panel two, representing NEMA. I sit on code-making panel 10, representing Eaton. And so I'm at these meetings as well, and I'm not an I'm an IEI member, but I don't represent IEI on these panels, but uh, on those two panels. But now there will be IAEI members who are who represent IAEI at these events, and you'll have utility people there. You will have design engineers. Great opportunity to hear different perspectives. 
feeder taps and supply side connections, secretary's luncheon, attendees. So, and then there's a special equipment and occupancies. Module five, hazardous locations, electric signs and motors. I mean, motors are very common. Uh, hazardous locations. I mean, if hazardous locations, that's like one of the areas that no matter no matter how many classes I go, I sit in, I'm always learning something new. I don't work in hazardous locations uh, applications every day. But when you talk to people who do, you learn the intricacies of those applications. And then uh, sept, uh, module six is going to be residential dwellings where you're going to talk about required circuits, load calculations, uh, multifamily dwelling unit requirements, meeting evaluation of German. So what you're seeing is a curriculum, and I really love this curriculum. It's a curriculum that is appealing to a wide audience. If you're a residential person, you have something. If you're a commercial person, you've got something. If you're a heavy industrial application type of individual, and that's what you are, where you're working, at, it's in here. So great curriculum coming out of the Northwestern and Southwestern sections. The Eastern section is gonna be at the Sheridan Pittsburgh, right here in my backyard. Um, and let's click on the Eastern section. Uh, Jimmy Rogers is the secretary, David Platt, great, two great individuals. And Jim is uh, is co-making panel chair for panel four. Uh, both of these individuals heavily engaged in the electrical industry. Uh, you can't, I mean, the individuals, that are the, the, the membership, you know, IEI is all about its membership. It's all about its people. Uh, and, and that's its strength. And the diversity in this organization is just tremendous from a knowledge perspective and, and many different aspects. Um, you have your uh, section meeting, you've got a registration link right here. I don't believe they have their agenda up yet, but keep checking it out. Uh, I'm, I've, I know I'm presenting on ArcFlash, I believe I'm presenting, I've committed to, uh, on ArcFlash and the National Electrical Code. Uh, so Incident Energy and the National Electrical Code. So hopefully, uh, I know that's at least one topic that will be on the agenda. The Western section, it's going to be oh, it's Shanty Creek, Shanty Creek, Michigan, uh, uh, Bel Air, Michigan, uh, September 19th through the 22nd. If you come over here, you'll see the program and the Western section sponsorship. We've uh, put up, put up, put up, put up. Uh, let's do the, uh, let's go to meeting. There's the registration link. Let's take a look at the registration link. All right, so uh, the, the lineup, um, uh, hazardous locations, swimming pool bonding. This meeting is heavy in code panels. And, and we talk, again, when we talk about code panels, these are Q&A. So we have a code panel on Monday. We have a NERDL panel on Monday, a NERDL nationally recognized testing laboratories. Uh, this is, uh, these are gonna be questions about the listing and labeling of products focused on the proper application of products that are listed and labeled. NEC 2020 top changes, that's gonna be the, the one and only Keith Laughlin, healthcare, grounding and bonding, receptacle spacing, code breakfast, and a code panel too. So uh, it's heavily weighted in code questions and whatnot. So you're gonna to wanna to check that one out. And that is on September 19th through the 22nd. That's over a weekend. So no excuses uh, in, in Bel Air, Michigan. No, that's not over a weekend. That's a Sunday through Wednesday. The Eastern section typically is over the weekend, 17th through the 19th. Sorry about that. Canadian section is, uh, is a virtual meeting. So those details will be coming soon and that's gonna be on September 24th. So stay tuned if you're, uh, if you're interested in the Canadian section, it's going to be virtual. So we can apply that anywhere. The Southern section is from October 10th through the 13th. The 2021 Southern Section meeting. Let's take a look at this one. I love their website. Check this one out. It's going to be at the Crown Plaza Tennyson Golf Resort, one resort drive in the Asheville, North Carolina. Ought to be an awesome meeting. Asheville, North Carolina is a beautiful area. Almost as beautiful as Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Just saying. October 10th through the 13th. And um, countdown to 78 days. 21 hours, eight minutes and 13 seconds. So you're gonna enjoy that one. Uh, I know there is an agenda. There's the hotel information. Let's take a look at their agenda. 
Okay, so what do we have? We have committee meetings. We have board of director meetings. We have a get, a get acquainted social and trade show. So from six o'clock to eight o'clock, you're going to want to check out the trade show again and the social event. This is the time, you know, it's it's a it's an informal moment to interact with others. You know, you 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 come downstairs and and uh, you you know get out of that hotel room. Get out, talk to the vendors, get a lay of the land, talk to uh, other IEI uh, members and other uh, people who are going to be participating in the event. So great opportunity to network. And, and I'll tell you, networking is, is very uh, an important aspect of uh, these meetings and your IEI membership. We have an NFPA report and testing labs report. We've got a Q&A with Holland, Laughlin, Wages, Fecto, Odie, and Dabrowski. So there's a lineup right there. My goodness. Uh, that ought to be a really good, uh, good Q&A session. We have energy codes, electrical uh, energy codes uh, from Brian Holland, and it looks like Mitchell as well. Uh, uh, Mr. Fecto will have a, um, a UL meeting from 5 to 5.50, and that's for inspectors only. We have a dinner planned, we have a secretary, we have registration, we've got a trade show, Article 706, Energy Storage Systems, 705, Interconnected Power Production Sources, and Article 712, Microgrids, that ought to be a great discussion. Article 517 for health care, uh, Vince Delacroche and Mark Odie, that ought to be a good discussion. Article 250, Grounding and Bonding uh, with uh, Keith Laughlin. And uh, a social mixer and a cash bar. There's another, th again, what, what, I, what I love about the section meetings, lots of opportunities to network. It's very important that you network. And then Wednesday, 2020 code changes with Steinman, Laughlin, Wages, Kevin Arnold, Jeff Fecto, and Joe Andre. There's another great lineup. Uh, and again, that's uh, the same crew. Uh, from eight o'clock through noon, and then uh, it's it's over. So, and that's the Southern Section meeting in Asheville, North Carolina. You're going to want to attend that one at the Crown Plaza Tennis and Golf Resort. Beautiful. So, and and you know, please uh, you know, check out the uh, other resources out here on the IAEI website. Uh, there's a lot of really good information uh, out there for you. So that was the Eastern Section. There's the Western section in Bel Air, Michigan in person. I just basically went through these on the website. Crown Plaza, there's your Asheville, North Carolina. So that's the, uh, the lineup from the section meetings perspective. So uh, again, take advantage of, uh, of the in-person. I mean, it's gonna be great to get back into a room and shake hands with people. So, uh, or bump elbows or do the fist pump, whatever you feel comfortable with. Let your, uh, let your people know. So uh, we are going to have a great, uh, a great meeting, and I'm really looking forward to uh, to the section meetings. Okay, grounding and bonding. You know that you, as you can see in multiple section meetings, there is going to be a discussion around grounding and bonding, and I think that that is a very important aspect of um, electrical safety. And and if you want to get really down to fundamentals. Grounding and bonding is right there. That's the foundation for the electrical distribution system. So the more we know about grounding and bonding, grounding and bonding, the better off we are. And I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. There is a resource. Now, I don't want you going out and telling everybody because we may run out of this resource. Then again, you might wanna tell everybody. There's a special resource that the IAEI has that I'm telling you is one of the best documents uh, that either it has such a great history. The Source Grounding and Bonding Book. Now, I just bought the latest version online, so I haven't gotten my book in. I got my electronic copy in, but this is the 2017 version. This one, that was the 13th. This is even before. This is the uh, uh, the 12th edition of the Soars and Grounding book. And I even have a copy of the third edition. 
of the Soars and Grounding book. If you if you have a first edition, let us know in the chats, uh, in the chat box, in the comments. Uh, but my uh, my history goes back to this third edition. I'll tell you why I loved this one was because it was easy to take on a plane and read it. Uh, this information is absolutely um, it, it's it's very essential to understand grounding and bonding. And I'm telling you, this is a topic where you will see the passion come out. You will see the arguments. You will see the gloves come off in many cases because of the passion around this, what you would think is a simple topic. It is not. Uh, the source and grounding book, in my opinion, is the industry reference. And I was, su I was surprised um, to know. So, Let's take a look. What I did was uh, I went out to the store. And if you look, uh, when you go out to the store on the IAEI website, you can download the catalog of everything that's out there. You've got the analysis of changes. You have Fermi's uh, Fast Finder Index. You have the National Electrical Code you can buy through the IAEI. You have study guides. You have one and two family residential, another great program. Oh, I'm telling you, this is a good program. This 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 book here focuses in on just uh, one and two family requirements. Really good resource. And there it is. Oh, soars, grounding, and bonding. Uh, and look at this. It's only $79. And if you are a member of IAEI and you sign in, you'll get a better discount off of that $79. So that is a really good resource, and, and it's not expensive, in, in, at least in, in my opinion. Uh, you may say $79 is expensive, but uh, I would say if you join, if you have an IEI membership, it, it will be uh, less expensive than that. And also, um, I'm telling you, it's, it's worth the investment because, I, I mean, look at my book. It's full of, uh, it's full of, uh, of, of, of these uh, tabs and and I've got notes in here and I write in it. It is um, a very heavily used resource of mine. Uh, and I think one that uh, I would not feel comfortable not having it on my on my library, in my library. Uh, and right now it's in my drawer. So again, um, very worth, worth the effort and your money and your time to read through it because we all need to brush up on our grounding and bonding, very important topic. So, uh, and, and I'm telling you that we will be having, you saw the topics that are gonna be coming up. If you, uh, if you go to the section meetings, very well uh, could be that you uh, can order the Source and Ground book as a part of your uh, registration, I'm not sure. So that's another important thing to ask whenever you register. So, um, you're gonna to wanna to get that copy because on this program, on the IAEI News Live, I plan to have some grounding and bonding snippets of information and we have educational resources. The links are down below for uh, a, a, an in-depth uh, source grounding and bonding class with uh, Chuck Mello and Chuck is, um, let's see if Mr. Mello, is uh, let me just double check here 13th i'm looking at the 13th edition um notice to the author the book is uh, uh soars used to soars uh ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. there it is the principal contributors to the revisions of the 11th 12th and 13th editions were charles f mello and keith laughlin so and i believe Charles, Chuck is uh, very much involved with the latest version, which I'm showing right here. Um, so the Source Grounding and Bonding book, uh, and I know Mr. Mello, um, he put together an educational program, and there are snippets out there from uh, Mr. Keith Laughlin. I encourage you to watch those. The links are down below, so you're going to want to check those out. All right. So now... I want to talk about Article 555. Now is the right time to talk about this topic because we are in the, it's, it's what, July, July 23rd. And we are in the heat of summer. 
no pun intended. And now is the time everybody's getting out there in those inner tubes and they're swimming and enjoying boats and boating and rafting and uh, all kinds of extracurricular activities in and around bodies of water. It's important for us to understand the hazards. So Article 555 has had quite a journey over the last few cycles. And I would say that journey hit the rapids around the 2011 National Electrical Code. And I'm gonna give you some of that history. Uh, I want to, and, and, and this little short clip of from a video uh, that, um, that it has Keith Laughlin, Jody Wages. It has Dean Hunter, who is on Code Making Panel 7. Now, Keith, remember, Keith, um, Keith Laughlin is chair of Code Making Panel 7, and Code Making Panel 7 addresses the articles around marinas and bodies of waters and things of that nature. Dean Hunter is on Code Making Panel 7. He's also, I believe, on the Correlating Committee. And then there's a voice you'll hear, you might hear in the background. I'm not sure if I have that in this clip, but uh, Donnie Cook uh, is out of Shelby County, Alabama. Uh, he used to be chief electrical inspector for Shelby County, Alabama, and now he works for an engineering firm doing inspections and working out in the field. Um, but Donnie Cook used to be chair of, I believe it was panel 17, if I'm not mistaken, that handles uh, swimming pools. So Donnie is knee deep in the swimming pools, but he's also knee deep in the marina environment because of, um, you know, he, in, in his jurisdiction, unfortunately, in many jurisdictions, there are bills, you know, going through legislature with the names of children who passed away due to swimming in and around a marina. And I can tell you personally, Lucas Ritz touched my life and got me and Joe Fellow involved with this whole thing we call marinas and marina safety. But this snippet, I really enjoyed because Keith went through an explanation of why, why I think that having this little tech talk, this little IAEI IAE, IAE News Live focus on marinas is critically important, and I'm going to let you uh, watch this. This slide here makes perfect sense if you look at it. When we expect the most uh, electric shock drownings are in the uh, months between April and October. In, the, in most parts of the country, the weather is warm. People are actually out in the water and associated with boating and stuff. Um, the other slide, uh, he brought up some interesting points about what may have happened in the past, and I'll, I'll let him elaborate. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, the slide previously, I think, was kind of, <clears throat> I don't think there was anything telling uh, shocking about that slide, you know, it shows that uh, ESD errs more in the summer months than it does time else. But this slide right here, um, I would propose that this might be a little bit misleading in the fact that if you just look at this graph uh, at face value, say that about 2009, 2010, uh, electric shock drownings were on the rise, started going up and up and up. And I think what's happening in reality here is I think we were having probably the same amount of ESD incidents back in 1999 or so, um, back in the 90s, but we just weren't calling it ESD. Um, we didn't we hadn't done the research. We haven't. We hadn't associated uh, electrical current in the water. You know, back in '99, um, a person jumps into the water at a marina. Um, there's current in the water. Their muscles are contracting, paralyzed. They can no longer swim, and they actually drown because they couldn't keep yourself afloat anymore because of that muscle contraction. Um, 
in other words, and I, I mean, it's, it's kind of crude to say, but that person drowned before they had the opportunity to be electrocuted. Um, and, mm-hmm. and, and, but on the death certificates and things back in the 90s, I think it was just showing up as, hey, it was a drowning. Keith pointed out a very, uh, I think, uh, important uh, point. And, and the reason I say that is because if you talk to, if you watch the videos around Lucas Ritz, uh, R-I-T-Z, uh, Lucas's father explains and his mother explains in one of the videos, and I'll put the link down below for that. I mean, that video, that video is worth the 15 or 20 minutes that I can't remember exactly how many minutes it is, but it's somewhere in that ballpark. That will be a good spend of your time. Um, Mr. Ritz explained what happened to Lucas. And when, what happened basically after everything was said and done and the coroner's reports came out, they told him that Lucas drowned. Now, Lucas was wearing a life jacket and there, weren't, there was no water in his lungs. And his father said, I need to know why. I need to know what happened because he didn't drown and they were there. And before Lucas, you didn't have the term electric shock drowning. In my opinion, based upon my research, the loss of Lucas Ritz was that pivotal moment where we started to understand what is electric shock drowning. And to Keith's point, as we look back in time, how many deaths were categorized as drownings when in reality, they had an electrical source at the start. Lucas's story is, I think, something that you, if you're watching this, you need to watch that. You need to educate yourself on this thing we call electric shock drowning. And you need to understand the hazards in and around marinas. It's 14 minutes of your life. I knew it was in that ballpark. 14 minutes. This is the link. I will have it down below. It's important. It's important to me. And it's important to electrical safety. And it's only 14 minutes. The hazards in and around marinas are very, very real. These are the stories that you read. Use your search engine on the internet. Search for it. You'll find the numbers. You'll find the examples. This story is one that I use in many ways. I, I do educational programs on safe work practices, NFPA 70E. And we talk about the shock, levels of shock, right? We talk about the levels of current passing through the body, what we experience. So many milliamps, you feel a tingle, then you feel the, the muscles contract, then the heart contracts, and then you get burns, etc. In the video, in that link, you'll hear Lucas's brother explain that when they saw Lucas gasp, that they started swimming towards, you know, his brother said he started swimming towards Lucas. And he says, as he was approaching, he felt the water pulsing. He felt the tingling. And he didn't know, he was a child, he didn't understand what that was, but you and I know 
because we're versed in electrical safety. We're versed in what shock, what current does to the body. We know we're going to feel a tingling sensation at certain current levels of milliamps. Then we're going to feel our muscles contract. And if you're in the water and your muscles are contracting, don't you think that's gonna feel like the water is pulsing? So Lucas's brother experienced it. He experienced current passing through his body and he lived to tell about it. Cheryl, Lucas's mother, jumped in the water and if you watch this video, she'll tell you she thought it was the adrenaline. She couldn't move. Why couldn't she move? Because current was passing through her body and she, her muscles were contracted. And Keith said it right. Many people, their muscles will contract and what do we do? We sink. And you can't swim, so you end up succumbing to drowning. And this story, this video, I'm telling you, is very much worth your time in watching. There's another example, Cherokee Lake Marina near Bean Station, July 4th. We're in the middle of July. We're, we're coming towards the end of July. This is peak season. Noah Winstead. And if you're familiar, you, you, might, be, you might be aware of the Noah Winstead Act that was reviewed in this state. What's happening now is across the country, in West Virginia, we had the Cunningham Act. What we're trying to do is recognize we need to address electrical safety in these aging marinas. Electrical distribution equipment doesn't last forever. And when you put them next to a lake, that is a recipe that needs attention to address the safety concerns. Michael Knudsen. When Michael Knudsen jumped into the water at the end of FDOC, he immediately began to struggle due to electric shock and immediately attempted to swim and hold on to the FDOC platform, at which time he was electrocuted. Now, in that program, I have the link down below. Keith Laughlin, Dean Hunter, Jody Wages, and Donnie Cook expanded on uh, marinas. And I believe, I don't know, I think it was Keith who pointed out that what you perceive as safety in a marina might not be safety. That metal ladder hanging into the water when you're struggling might look like a very attractive solution to get out of the water, but in reality could be the source of the electric current that's passing through you. And the closer you get to it, the more current that you'll experience. Understanding electric shock, electric shock drowning, how current flows through the water is a critical part of electrical safety. That even if you don't design those systems, if you have a boat, even if you don't have a boat, if your friends have a boat, if your kids go to friends' homes who have boats, Awareness is the first step. Educate yourself, educate your family, educate people you know. And the IAI is here to help you do that. So they'll explain to you, this, this class explains the gradients and how current passes through the water and how it dissipates through the water and how those fields flow. There's a discussion about salt water versus fresh water in this session. There's a discussion about um, the hazards, whether they are on the dock and the pier, or maybe the hazard originates in the boat. In Lucas Ritz's case, the problem was in the boat. It wasn't on the dock. It was a boat that had a, a wiring issue, and the current was entering the water through possibly the rudder in the boat because that's that metal object that's hanging off the back. Even if it's a fiberglass boat, you may say, I'm in a fiberglass boat. I can't in interject current into the water. But unless your motor is fiberglass and plastic and your rudder is plastic, you have an avenue to inject current through the motor, through that propeller. 
And this is a table that I was talking about. One milliamp to eight milliamp, tingle sensations of shock, not painful. You'll hear that muscle control is not lost. Eight to 15 milliamps, you get muscle control not lost, but you have a painful shock. And then you have muscle control, paralysis, inability to swim. And if you listen and watch that video, you will hear Lucas's brother and his mother explain what, in my opinion, relates directly to this table. These are examples of what we're facing in and around marinas. The hazards come because electrical distribution systems don't last forever. And this is inside of, a, inside of that boat, inside of a structure. Those conductors get worn and they may not, you may not touch them directly, but if they energize the infrastructure, water can enter the boat or the water or uh, electricity can enter the water through that rudder. There's an example. The, these conductors, they go over the edge of these marinas and they uh, provide an opportunity that if they're worn, if that conductor gets worn and rubbed and, it, and there's a conductors that are exposed, that electricity enters the water. We've got to be aware of the conditions. You know, here's here's a case. You know, look at the look, look at all the conductors hanging over the edge of this and that boat. I mean, there are they have uh, those. I don't know what you call them buoys or whatever. The one is up is up. I mean, this one here is not hanging over the edge. What if the other one wasn't hanging over the edge and that boat was rubbing against those conductors? Do you think it happens? It does. Then I call this the MacGyver factor. If there's anything to be said about us as human beings, as individuals, we will make it happen. No power? I got duct tape. I can make it happen. That is not a proper application. If that enters and goes over the edge, this over here, this little brown area, that's water. This is the edge of the pier. If that goes into the water, you are introducing current into the water. There's the MacGyver factor again. I mean, at least they used weather and they used the right conductor for the application, I guess. I don't know. But look at this. Look at the holes inside and the cover is not on this receptacle. And, and there, if you do your searches, there are cases. Michael Knudsen, they found was a receptacle outlet that was filled with water that was energizing the infrastructure. No covers, open holes. NFPA 70B is our reference for maintenance. This type of an environment is, is prime for maintenance. People live on their boats in many cases. This is a freezer, refrigerator. You've got an air conditioning unit, very similar to a dwelling unit. I'm not sure what he was doing with the, uh, with the cart, but um, these installations are used heavily. You've got examples like this, that cover. We, we talk about in-use covers. We talk about heavy duty. We talk about the proper maintenance to make sure that you don't have water intrusion. These are pictures I've taken. These are places I've been. You've got, uh, you've got marinas where the piers will float and, and rise and, and lower based upon the water level. You have wires going out across that little bridge, across bridges like this. There, you'll see the the the, the flexible metal, the flexible conduit that will take the power out there to the uh, pier. This is the marina where the Cunningham child passed away. 
Electrical equipment in and around these areas does not last forever. And a sign does not automatically make that location safe. When I was a kid, no fishing meant that's the best fishing spot this side of the Mason-Dixon line, and the other side too. And no swimming meant great swimming opportunity. You gotta think about the hazards and you have to think about the maintenance of the electrical distribution system. These pedestals are, uh, are great resources. They provide water. They provide you know, fresh water for, for hosing down the boat. They provide electricity. They provide light. But they don't last forever, especially if they're abused. Especially if they're never cleaned or maintained. The inspection that I was helping with on this case, every one of these doors we opened was a new experience. Over 90% of the receptacles we tested were providing power, but were not providing GFCI protection. In this type of condition, this type of environment, we cannot expect these devices to last forever. Good old MacGyver coming back again. And in some cases, look at this one here, did not, it wasn't the right box, it wasn't the right enclosure. If that box fills up with water, it is mechanically, electrically connected to the infrastructure. That infrastructure becomes energized. You've got to be mindful. You've got to raise your awareness on these types of scenarios. You've got to educate yourself. That's why the IAEI provides these opportunities to educate on marina health care, marina and, and uh, health and safety. You have the experts. You've got individuals like Keith Laughlin, who is chair of Code Making Panel 7. You've got Dean Hunter, who's on Panel 7 on the Coraline Committee. You've got uh, uh, Donnie Cook, who, who, who has much experience in and around these areas, working, looking at marinas. Manufacturers are engaged with the IAEI helping create materials. They're not expensive, very worth your time to get engaged. Inspections are important. Periodic inspection. Um, NFPA 303 is uh, uh, another great reference out, outside of um, nfpa.org slash 303. I'll give you the title of this one. Okay. Fire protection standard for marinas and boat yards. NFPA 303. If you do marina work, if you are involved, if you are a boater, if you have a boat in a marina, you want to educate yourself so that you know what type of environment you are in. You know how to, you know, part of electrical safety and electrical safe work practices is recognizing the hazards. One step of that is to know what is shock, right? What is the voltage threshold for shock? NFPA 70E helps us understand that if I've got 120 volts, I've got a shock hazard. If I have exposed 120 volts, I have a shock hazard. If I have 480 volts, et cetera. I have an arc flash hazard as well. But another aspect of electrical safety and electrical safe work practices is to be able to recognize the hazards and in and around marinas. You have to be able to spot the problems so that you know how to address them. You gotta be able to look at these installations and know that's a potential hazard. And you're walking down this ramp and you see electrical distribution equipment, the condition of that equipment, 
the conductors that are going down. You look at right at the bottom of this, there's conductors coming from that distribution equipment going down into the water. The condition of this equipment is critical. Your eyes, your ears, all play a role in helping you understand and identify the hazards. Knowing where your disconnects are, knowing where your power, your emergency shutoffs are, if there are any installed, overhead lines that that go from one side to, to maybe goes to the to the pier from the shore, or maybe in between piers. These are all things you need to be aware of. You need to you, you need to be looking at on a periodic basis. Are those conductors where they come out of those out of that conduit out of that raceway? Are they being protected correctly? Were the right fittings put on the ends so that they are not damaging the ends of those uh, the conductors? If you think about it, there's wind and they're rubbing constantly. These are areas that you need to be aware of to be able to understand the hazards. I mean, and and look, I mean, a marina is is a, a very dynamic installation. You've got hazardous location applications as well. You'll have fuel pumps out there. You'll have fuel stored out on the uh, docks and on the piers. Those are things you need to be thinking about as well. It's not just about uh, panel boards and receptacles and pedestals. You could have Haslock uh, type of applications out there. Where is, are, are you protecting the equipment? Do you have fencing around the equipment? Is your service, where is the service equipment located? What is the condition of maintenance of said circuit uh, service equipment? You'll notice in this, you have this nice big gray box, but look right over here, you've got the transformer, short circuit current ratings, interrupting ratings, the proper chapters one through four still apply even though you're in article 555. Chapters one through four apply generally. You've got to follow all of the rules. The available fault current at this panel is going to be pretty significant, especially because you are right there at the secondary of that transformer and you have a very short run of conductor. You've got to apply all of the rules and all of the principles. Everything applies. As you look and you look at the installations and you look at the equipment, the condition of the equipment, the raceways, the conduit. I've seen and I've got pictures of conduit that have separated over time. You can see the conductors inside the raceway. Plastic, PVC, the glue, it's out there in the sun. The methods that we use, the wiring methods that we use are critical. Chapter three of the National Electrical Code. Proper application is critical. And, and as we go through the years, we become smarter about solutions and products. What is installed at your facility or at a facility might need to be reconsidered because of how we've advanced in electrical safety and knowledge of application of products and solutions in and around these types of environments. NFPA 303 is a great reference for you. If you don't have a copy of 303 and you have a boat, you win work in and around marinas. You design marinas. If you don't have this, you need this reference. It's not that expensive and it's not that much of a read. And you can access it for free online at, at nfpa.org. Remember, all of these codes and standards are available for free. You can read them online. You may not be able to print them. You may not be able to copy and paste from them. You might not be able to annotate them, but you can read them for free online. Go to nfpa.org 303 and you'll find this document. You can read the latest and any previous version. The National Electrical Code, Article 555, if you look at the requirements in 555 of the NEC, got to get my book. This is the 14 version, and I got the 14 version, and I pulled out the 17 version, and I pulled out the 11 version for this discussion, because all of these are important to the topic uh, that we are talking about right now. The 11 version is when the first introduction of the ground fault requirements for marinas was introduced. 
And I'm going to tell you a little story behind that. 555.3 and 553.4 in the NEC 2011 version, you will find language And you may not have a version, uh, the, a 2011 copy, so I'm going to use mine. 555, we'll try 553 first since it's uh, sooner. 553 was floating buildings, and you'll notice that in the latest version of the National Electrical Code, we combined 553 and 555 together. And in 553, you're going to find language in 553.4 that says, this is what 553.4 says in the 2011 version. The service equipment for a floating building shall be located adjacent to, but not in or on the building or any floating structure. The main overcurrent protective device that feeds the floating structure shall have ground fault protection not exceeding 100 milliamps. Ground fault protection of each individual branch or feeder circuit shall be permitted as a suitable alternative. And I'll give you the story behind this. And you're going to find similar language in 555.3. It was a whole new section in 555.3 called ground fault protection. The main overcurrent protective device that feeds the marina shall have ground fault protection not exceeding 100 milliamps. Ground fault protection of, at, of each individual branch or feeder circuit shall be permitted as a suitable alternative. Two things are required for shock drowning. An electrical fault to ground, either in the marina or in the boat and an incomplete circuit caused by the faulty or non-existent circuit back to the dock's grounding system. You will get water flowing through the water and cause electric shock drowning. Thus, Joe Fellow, Joe Fellow approached me one day. I left the note on my chair and I came back from traveling and he, he left a note which was a piece of paper with Lucas Ritz's story. And he said in his note, please see me. So he and I talked about this and, and we looked at the statistics of how many people were dying in and around marinas. And he was passionate about it. And I told him, I'll, I'll come up with the language and you come up with the substantiation. And I'll quite frankly, he had the easier part of the job. Because unfortunately, the substantiation was out there because of all of the deaths in and around marinas. So what we did was we started this journey out by saying the main overcurrent protective device, which feeds the building or floating structure distribution system, shall have GFCI protection for personnel. Individual GFCI protection for personnel fed by that feeder is an acceptable alternate to the main GFCI protection. So what we said was we wanted four to six milliamps on the main. And if you didn't do it on the main, each of the feeders, if they had four to six milliamps, you would provide protection for anything downstream. As long as only four to six milliamps, less than 46 milliamps was allowed. And our uh, substantiation, Joe Fellow wrote, shore power leakage currents on board vessel or due to aging infrastructure, lack of maintenance, conduit, or wire corrosion pose a hazard for potential leakage to ground that may cause electric shock drowning, fire, uh, wasted energy, and property damage. A GSA protection will, will add protection from such occasions. Uh, and, and we provided extra additional information that was available online to the code panel. And it was rejected. So Joe came to me after we found out it was rejected. And he, he, he was, he, I never seen a, a beat man in my life. And they, he, he just felt like it was, it, it just was never gonna happen. And I said, well, Joe, let's take a look at the panel statement. Neither of us were at the meeting. 
And what I loved was the very first sentence. It said, although the recommendation has merit, additional technical substantiation and product development is needed. The use of GFCI for personnel protection is not prohibited by the current code. The proposed requirement uh, for 6 milliamp leakage is not practical for all floating building environments. And they said the same thing in 555. So what did we do? We came back with another proposal or a, or a public comment. And the public comment was uh, what you see on the screen here. And I'm going to uh, make this a, um, a little, uh, hopefully a little bit more readable for you. There we go. So what we said was the main overcurrent protective device which feeds the floating structure shall have ground fault protection not exceeding 100 milliamps. So what does that mean? That means 30 milliamps will work. GFCI, four to six milliamps will work. There was no excuse for the code panel to say there was no product available because there was product available on the market with that language. And it says ground fault protection for each individual branch or feeder circuit shall be permitted as a suitable alternative. So you could have ground fault protection, which is not GFCI. It's anything up to 100 milliamps. So it could be 30 milliamps, could be 60 milliamps. 50 milliamps. There could be relays, which uh, there were bender relays that, that existed. There were circuit breakers that existed to meet this code requirement. There were circuit breakers that could be put into those pedestals at the time of this code requirement. So product existed and the panel could not say no. And they passed this language. It passed. Eligible to vote, nine. Ballots results, nine affirmative. Our substantiation was we appreciated their recognition of the hazard and we made it happen. And I'll tell you, after this went into the National Electrical Code in the 2011 cycle, people went ballistic. They were concerned. There were claims that there's no products that existed because nobody makes a 100 milliamp device because it says, the main overcurrent protective device shall have ground fault protection not exceeding 100 milliamps. Many people misread that and said, you need a 100 milliamp device, and that's not the case. 30 milliamp GFPE would work, and we all know there are 30 milliamp GFPE devices out there readily available on the market. There were relays that would go up to 100 milliamps and beyond and, and lower that could be used and shunt tripping circuit breakers. So product was available on the market. So we went through a, a, a turmoil of disbelief, disagreement with the requirement, claims that there were no products, but we proved that differently. And then that started an entirely different area of, of research because the, the, um, the uh, uh, NFPA Research Foundation, they published this study that said assessment of hazardous voltage currents in marinas, boatyards, and floating buildings. And they did a lot of research and they recommended, they lowered the 100 milliamps down to 30. Because they said primarily, and I think the, the one of the mistakes that was made was that they looked at the requirements for boats. And there was a, a and, and in this training class, they talk about an organization uh, that has a um, a standard that you may list or not list to that you may conform with. It's not a requirement, but they they have in their uh, allocations for 30 milliamp ground fault protection of equipment on the main inside the boat. So they tried to align that, but the language of the code said the main. So the NFPA Research Foundation put this document out, and then we changed uh, the requirements, and we needed a TIA. And right now, what you have in the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code, in my opinion, is beautiful language in that it provides a layered approach to ground fault protection inside of a marina. They, um, they established 100 milliamps at the main, 30 milliamps on feeders, and then four to six milliamps for those receptacle outlets. And I think that will make a difference in electrical safety in and around marinas. The, ground, the, the, the 2017 code made a change for all overcurrent devices to be 30 milliamps based upon that research. 
And then in the 2020 code, they cleaned that language up and now they provide those options or those layered approach to ground fault protection. And I think that's going to go a long way. You've got to attend the IAEI educational programs on these topics. And remember, just when you thought it was simple, they go and they put a gas pump out there in the middle of a pier. So my message is, and I hope you, uh, I, I hope that you you understand. Sign up for those IEI section meetings, sharing your knowledge, sharing your expertise, mingling and connecting with others in the electrical industry. These are the times to do it. Get your copy of Source Grounding and Bonding. And remember, elevate your awareness, your level of awareness of marina safety. It could save your life. It could save somebody's life you know. It could save somebody's life in your family. The more we understand about the hazards, the better off we all are. So I really appreciate you taking the time to spend with me to talk about these three topics. And you will see materials here every Tuesday. This was pre-recorded uh, and I am monitoring the chat. So you probably see me out there noting and, and messaging. But thanks for watching. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate what you do for the electrical industry. The IAEI appreciates you. And together, I believe we can all make a difference. So please, until next Tuesday, stay safe, stay healthy. Take care.